Hey, Ben Reeves. How's it going, Kyle? And Leo Vader. Hello, Kyle. And me, Kyle Hilliard. Uh, do you guys know Mark Laidlaw? Yeah. Yeah, he was a writer on Half-Life 1 and 2 and the episodes. And recently, at the time of recording today, he actually released a blog that basically discusses in full what would have happened in Half-Life 2 Episode 3, which is nuts. Is that what I have here? That's what you have in your hand right now, Leo. Wow. That sounds insane. This is how they release Half-Life 3. This is it, man. They This, this is, is the how they do it. I mean, this is essentially Half-Life 3. Mm -hmm. This, uh, I don't know what you call it, because it's a blog post. It's kind of a, a summary. It's a plot for, there's, like, there's even uh, moments in there that you can, like, imagine where gameplay would have taken place and stuff like that. But <laughs> this is... This is episode three. This is Half-Life 2 episode three and maybe even, you know, an ending for Half-Life. Right. In theory. Uh, which, which is, is insane. pretty crazy. And it's cool to one one sense. Like, we haven't had Half-Life for, like, over a decade. And now we have this. And it's kind of, like, to get as official of a stance as we can get, like, from the writer of the original games. Like, this is his, where he wanted to go with this. So that's really cool. But it's also kind of, like, a little sad because, like, well... We're not getting it, you know, it's kind of like just a realization that I think we've all known for a while, like we're not getting Half-Life I mean, it, it is almost a nail in the coffin to a certain degree of like, they're not making this. So let's just, let's, here's what would have happened if we had made it. Right, it's interesting because there was a Twitter interaction with him today where somebody was saying they didn't fully understand the relationship between Alex and the G-Man mm -hmm. that was laid out in this uh, blog. And he said he couldn't go into it more because Valve might want to expand on it. In the future. Was really? Wording. Yeah. Oh. Weird. Okay. In like a card game or something? <laughs> oh, God, <laughs> yeah. I hope so. He's going to be a playable character in Dota soon enough. Ooh. Uh, so let's let's kind of go through it uh, bit by bit. It actually starts with... So the, uh, heads up. The, lots of spoilers for Half-Life, Half-Life 2, Half-Life yeah. 2, Episode 1, Episode 2. Eli just died uh, over the course of this story. Sure. And uh, Alex and Gordon are now heading to Antarctica to try to find the Borealis, the yeah. ship that they kind of teased. We should say, too, that it might be helpful to go read the blog post if you haven't already. Like, you should we're absolutely not going read the to, blog like, post. Yeah. go over that in detail, but we are going to talk about, like, what the contents of that post are. Yeah, and no, just a quick aside, like, the version we have that we, we grabbed right when it went up uh, kind of late last night, uh, thank you, Ben Hansen, for grabbing the text for that, but this morning... Uh, Mark actually updated the blog where he changed a lot of the names. Yeah. So like names that were really like Gordon Freeman and Alex Vance and Eli are all different names. It's like Gertrude you, Fremont yeah. or something like if that. You go to the, now, yeah. I guess he just, maybe he's trying to be sneaky and doesn't want Valve to know that he posted that. I don't think anybody's going to catch on. <laughs> yeah. What trying to do here. <laughs> Valve has no idea. Uh, so, okay. So yeah, it starts with them, Alex and Gordon heading to Antarctica with the idea that there's, like, another group behind them, I guess. Like, a, a, an army that's going to come help them. I don't know why they couldn't just go at the same time, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> and they find the Borealis, and they also find Dr. Mossman, who is, if you guys remember, kind of... We're not sure if she's good or evil. Right. Um, Alex seems to think she's definitely evil because she blames the death of her father on her. And there's actually a moment here where she kind of says, you know, I've always been a double agent... Uh, I was, you know, I I pretended to be working with the Combine to help the Resistance. And, uh, you know, uh, Mark Laidlaw actually lines out here that Alex does not believe her. But strangely, Gordon Freeman, as the player, I guess, does. Which is weird to me. Like, where, is Mossman good or bad? Like, I still don't really know uh, after the course of reading this. Yeah, and we, I assume we're going to get to it later, like, Mossman's fate. Yes. Uh, but, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. And then kind of colors Alex in a way. I guess we can get to that ahead of time. But you yeah. mentioned the Borealis. Which is the, the which, ship. Which is the ship that goes disappearing. And it's it's also, there was a connection to Aperture Science because he mentions Aperture by name yeah, at one point. They talk about something called the bootstrap device. Which is which, in the Borealis. Yeah, Aperture is working on. Yes. I believe. And also I believe the Borealis is, is featured, not featured, but like mentioned in Portal 2, I want to say, right? It is. Yeah, you can, yeah. you can find the dry dock where the Borealis disappeared from. Right. So um, that was just kind of a cool like way to connect those two franchises, which have always been sort of like tenuously connected. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just that this game is theoretically would have continued to reference Portal is kind of cool. Yeah, and the idea, at least that's what I took from it, is that Aperture made this thing, the bootstrap device. Uh, which was similar to their portal device. And what uh, Mark Layla writes is, 
with the bootstrap device, there was no need for entry or exit portals or any other devices. It was entirely self-contained. It was. It sounds like it was something that would just let you travel anywhere you wanted instantly. Right. Uh, which also makes it very dangerous because it's a very powerful thing to be able to just go anywhere instantly. He also mentions that the Aperture Enrichment Center was located in Lake Michigan. Do we know yeah. location before? Is this I don't new? Know. Was that a known thing? I, I didn't know. Like, it. I feel no. like this is new news. Wow. wow. Breaking. <laughs> exclusive. Breaking. Exclusive. <laughs> Official. Uh, yeah. And uh, and then the thing that gets really crazy, which I've, I've seen other people already sort of theorizing on Twitter, that one of the reasons that the game never came to be is because of what is happening in the Borealis. Just mm -hmm. sounds absolutely crazy and awesome because it's like shifting in and out of reality and time and like jumping all over the place. Uh, and uh, I guess the idea was that you and Alex and Dr. Mossman up to a certain point would be in that ship while all that was happening. So you're like fighting the combine and the ship is like phasing in and out of reality. And uh, yeah. I think they mentioned like bubbles. Wasn't that something? There were like like pockets of, of, of interdimensional travel or something right. like that, which like, God, who knows how the gravity gun would have played into all that. Like I. Yeah. There's not a lot insane. of mechanic stuff mentioned in this right? yeah there's all... only a few times where they even say and then we fought the right. combine for a while yeah yeah so obviously uh you know it would have been cool if we gotten a hint for like some new weapon ideas or new gameplay mechanics but not a lot of that's here then i triple jumped <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah or you know yeah. like an idea for like a new cool weapon is what yeah. i was hoping to like see like him yeah for sure like this new device that he used but unless uh what was that time travel device, the bootstrap thing? Like, yeah. unless that got worked into gameplay at some point, and you were using that to like blow I, people into the past or it something. Sounded like I don't maybe know. it was affecting the environment, but I don't know if you. This is this is all just assumptions based on right. You know, but like, it sounds like maybe it was just something that was happening that you would have to react to. I don't know if it was something that you you know had control over. Sure. As Gordon. Uh, this is a bit of a jump, time jump, but it reminded me of um, Titanfall Two. From last yeah. year and also um, Dishonored 2, like those games where you're traveling between two time periods. And this isn't exactly the same, but just the idea of seeing the Borealis float in and out of time and seeing it like fl flicker between like multiple timelines and like that technology of showing multiple times. Yeah. Back to back. Like it would have been cool if Valve had done this, you know, back when they were originally going to do a Half Life three episode three like, yeah because they would have beaten everybody to the punch by you know almost a decade which yeah. is cool yeah they talk let's see I, I can even read the the part where they kind of where mark describes what is happening you know on the borealis uh time grew confused looking from the bridge we could see the dry docks of aperture science at the moment of teleportation which that is really cool like basically that's that's the place you see in portal two if you track it track it down it's actually hidden and then, the, like, there would also be glimpses of, Mark wrote, just as the Combine forces closed in from land, sea, and air. So there's, like, the seven-hour war that gets referenced a couple times over the course of Half-Life, where the Combine just appeared and took over the Earth. Like, the idea that you could actually see that moment, even briefly, while in the Borealis is, sounds awesome. Because mm -hmm. in the over the course of the game, Gordon wakes up well after things have already settled. Like, the Combine had already taken over by the time right. Gordon reappears, you know? And then you're like jumping around to the Antarctic wastelands and you could, you know, jumping through time. And yeah, like that, that to me, like stepping away from this, like that seemed like the coolest sort of gameplay thing about all of this. Like it was nice to get all these revelations about where these characters ended up. But man, I wish I could see that game. Like I want to walk around the ship and see all that stuff happening. That, that sounds so amazing. Yeah. Well, there's moments in here where I read through it and I was like, I can picture pretty clearly what this could have looked like you know there's a moment where you run onto the borealis right as it's about to flicker out of time and then at that moment there's also like your troops are coming up uh from behind and also like the enemy combine is coming in to attack and like there's like this army clashing right as you board and then you blip out of time yeah i'm like oh that's cool like i can picture that pretty well I mean, some of the coolest moments from, like, Half-Life 2 are when you, like, I think it's, like, halfway through the game where you get stuck in that transporter with Alex and just two weeks pass, mm -hmm. like, in, in a, just a moment. And, like, things have changed in that two weeks. Like, everyone just thought you were dead. Yeah. And they're like, oh, my God, Gordon, you're back again. <laughs> yeah. It's cool how they, like, have messed with time in the, pa the past with the Half-Life franchise. And I bet they would have continued to do that with this in some cool and clever ways. There's even the talk of just... 
backing up a bit where you get on a transport plane and you fly out yeah to go to antarctica uh which i have to say antarctica would have been cool like environment to explore in half-life game half-life game because i don't think we really explored a lot of snow areas so that would have been kind of fun to see but then you your plane gets shot down and he even talks about in his in this write-up it's like oh my memory's kind of fuzzy here i mean you know it's like oh you can kind of see this like time jump or uh, he would have been knocked curious. out or something like yeah that. kind of curious to see how the game would have handled that if yeah he got knocked out he kind of wakes up and he's dazed yeah do you think the fact that some of these mechanics they're talking about jumping around in time dimensions and stuff as we saw in titanfall 2 and bioshock infinite those kinds of things do you think that factored into mark mr laidlaw deciding <laughs> to you. eventually release this does he think like if they if valve does go back to it there's no way they're still going to do this since it's in some That's ways been question. done across a bunch of different other things yeah like how reactive is valve to that you know mm-hmm. like do yeah. they see what other people are doing and be like well we got to cut that out we can't do that anymore that's a good yeah that's a good point i don't know it is a it's a great question it's a huge mystery to you because it's like how official was any of this to begin with obviously yeah. it was him so if he's still there at valve he could probably make this happen because he was you know pretty high which up. he is yeah which he's not like he and left he's not at valve last anymore year, yeah. right so that sort of makes a lot of this unofficial in a sense i mean it's official in that he wrote it and so i don't know if like this a similar write-up or treatment for half-life episode three is in a file cabinet somewhere at valve probably Mm -hmm. uh but that doesn't mean that valve has to stick to that if they were ever to release a game like that right yeah if they yeah they could do you're right they could totally do something completely different but even after reading this i would be totally happy to play this game (laughs) yeah (laughs) i think the foundation's there it sounds really solid it sounds like a really cool idea uh, and I'd, I'd be really excited to, to play it as well. Should we talk about like, before we jump into more of the Borealis stuff, talk about Dr. Breen. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Breen was, I guess, you know, the bad guy from half-life two, essentially. Mm-hmm. Like he was, I guess the, I, I, the human who negotiated, uh, the sort like he negotiated with the combine to let most humans live on earth. Right. And then he kind of works with them and he was killed at the end of, Episode one or episode? Do you guys remember? He was no Leo. You're good. Don't remember which one. No. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, that's why I was hoping you guys could remind me. I I have vague memories of like encountering encountering him in an office. Yeah, I think he was. I think when the uh, the central hub kind of blew up at the beginning of episode two, I think he was in there. And then the idea here is that though he did die, his consciousness was sort of like computerized and then put into one of the combine grub creatures brain yeah. grub a brain grub which uh <laughs> would have been an iconic character <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> everyone would know the name brain grub right now know. get just your action figures back. and how would that have worked yeah. i guess he would have been like a big slug with like a would he have just had dr breen's voice or just like a computerized face or i something? want to imagine yeah. he would have his face somehow yeah like in, like in halo the <laughs> com- the guy the commander with the in the oh, flood i know what you're talking about yeah yeah, yeah, that would have worked. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. But uh, I guess he, I guess he just does, he hates it, right? And he just wants you to kill kill him. It turns out being a slug's not fun. Yeah, I guess the combine they kind of suck, and like he doesn't like working for them. <laughs> would you guys like being a slug? Is my question I've written down here. Oh, good question. Another what, good question. What do slugs Leo eat? Yeah, thank you. What do slugs eat? Uh, no one knows. Moss. I don't know. Yeah, moss that from great. the IT crowd. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That'd be perfect. So being a slug's not fun. Yeah. Also, you're terrified of salt, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. I do like salt. Yeah, I like salty things. So, so, <laughs> so he he super dies, uh, which I guess Alex didn't wanted to torture him for a while, uh, but the player, as Gordon Freeman, is nice enough to just kill him immediately, which is well, very sweet of us. Well, it's confusing if he totally dies. The way it's it's worded is Alex wants to. Alex doesn't want to get him, give him a quick death yeah. is what it sounds like. Alex believed that a quick death was more than Wallace Breen deserved. Yeah. It might be a little bit of a stretch to say she was planning on torturing him for a while. <laughs> well, look, that's what I ran into it, so you know, I don't know what to tell you. The impression sure. I got was that Alex was ready to just walk away and let him die oh, slowly. Oh, sure. Yeah. sure. Live in his like, that makes more sense. terrible like sloth <laughs> form. She uh, was hooking up the electrodes <laughs> to his groin. <laughs> she brought her battery. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but then what I found was super interesting is that last line is like out of Alex's sight, I might've done something to hasten the grubs demise before we proceeded, which I was like, Oh, I could see this as an opportunity for like player choice. Like, Hey, yeah. are you going to hmm. flip this switch, which turns off his like life support or something? 
or just let him be. Or let him be. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder. Because I don't think it would come up again, but it would still be an interesting choice. Yeah. Yeah. It also, it kind of leads me to believe that, that even though, I mean, we'll get to the very end here in a bit, but like the fact that Breen is killed kind of makes me think that this w- could have been like a final Half-Life chapter, you know? Was it like just a, even if it was sure. episode three, like it would have marked a, maybe a finale for Half-Life? Sure. Which we can talk yeah. more about as we It talk definitely about more of the gives the series more closure than episode two did. Yeah. Because episode two left on, on a, a pretty big cliffhanger, I think. I was doing yeah. research on a site called Wikipedia. and I'm part of this. There was an interview with Gabe Newell from 11 years ago. So this is all really good information I'm about to give. <laughs> but it was Gabe Newell saying that essentially the Half-Life 2 episodes were Half-Life episode or Half-Life 3. Right. Okay. They were just putting it out episodic so it didn't take, you know, six years to come out. They would just do it bit by bit. Which and that so, fell apart. <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. I think I'd heard that before, but yeah. Yeah. So 11 years in that, ago, probably. Probably. Yeah. In that sense, I think it would make perfect sense if this were the last game in the series. Since yeah. it would be the end of the trilogy that was supposed to be Half-Life 3, essentially. Yeah, because so we have uh, Breen that dies, and then there's also an encounter with uh, Mossman, again, who is who is ambiguous about whose side she's really on. I guess she wants to save the Borealis and study it, but Alex wants to destroy it because that's what her father wanted. That right. was like her, her father's sort of dying wish, I guess. Do we know why her father wanted to destroy it? Uh, I think, no, I think in ha- in episode two, he said it was just really dangerous. Um, and there is actually, I, I wrote down here, going back and sort of going through the plot of episode two, there's a moment where he reveals, Eli reveals to the player, to Gordon Freeman, that he actually met with the G-Man at one point, and he actually promises to explain more later, but then he dies. Okay. So that's like a thread that's just like will forever be hanging from Half-Life 2 Episode 2 because sure. that character passes away. And I think that might play into the whatever the Borealis is. I think Eli just saw it as like way too powerful a weapon, you know, to have sure, like sure. instant travel would just be too powerful. So he would just wanted to see it destroyed. Well, you, you go back all the way to Half-Life 1 and what kicked off the invasion to begin with was the activation of that uh, machine. Yes. And I can't blanket on what it was. Uh, yeah, I don't remember what it was called. Which... It wasn't a teleportation machine. It was more of a collider, right? Yeah, they were they were experimenting with like going into different dimensions. And in fact, another thing that happened in Half Life Two Episode Two is that when Eli reveals that he has had communication with the G Man, he tells Gordon that like the object. If you guys remember that Gordon pushes into the laser in yeah. the first game, yeah, that first like game. causes everything to happen. Right. The G Man gave that uh that material to Eli. Oh, interesting. Which is like so he had connection with Eli. Yeah, which like makes uh, the G man here, uh, who's behind us, if you're <laughs> ah! listening to this, uh, like his motivations are just totally questionable and mysterious. Like he started all of this, and then he will like periodically come in and save people. Like he took uh, Alex away from an explosion at one point, and even said that a third party requested that he not do that. Like, he says something yeah. in passing that it's like, I was, whatever that weird tenor that he speaks where he's like, I was told to not save you, but <laughs> yeah. I made the decision to do it. You know, it's he's like, always been a super mysterious figure. I love him. And he, yeah, I think I he's a great. major crush on him. <laughs> oh. That's right. Uh, he's right behind you. Moving on. Uh, but yeah, he he's remains mysterious in this yeah. game. Yeah, and we can talk a little bit more about that. We can talk about that. Yeah. And uh, not yet, though. Not yet. <laughs> but what I was going to say earlier is like Half-Life 1 kicks off with you doing the Hadron Collider yeah, experiment, whatever the, yeah. and it uh, destroys the fabric in time, and that's what initiates the invasion. Yes. So I could see the where Eli yeah. would have been a- terrified of like, well, obviously we shouldn't be messing with this stuff. We shouldn't be tr- time traveling or porting through realities. So that's why he probably wants to destroy the bootstrap device. Yeah. Because it is one of those devices. He's like, we should just back away and maybe get out of this... Um, reality warping you know phenomenon yeah. let's maybe let's go hide in our hole again maybe let's not be part of the dimension hopping club right anymore. yeah it's just dangerous yeah let's not no longer prepare for unforeseen consequences we're like tiny slugs that can get eaten <laughs> that's right by mm-hmm. larger slugs so that what happens uh with with the borealis is mossman wants to save it and alex ends up killing her uh according to mr Landlaw's uh, outline here <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Because, I don't know, have you guys seen Alex as a cold stone killer? Well, her dad just died, so... Yeah. I guess she did, like, 
kill Combine. It's like not like she was an innocent person. Yeah, but, I mean, she's killed plenty of people. But it seems like they got into a fight, and then she killed Judith Mossman, and Judith was, wasn't a Combine. She was kind of more of a... Like a, a double agent Yeah, mystery figure is like, sh- obviously disagreed, but it I, feels like killing her was harsh to me. Yeah. Uh, I mean, maybe that's what they had to do, because then they, had, then, they, then they blow it up. Then they blow up the Borealis. But it kind of sets up Alex, at least in my mind, is like, well, okay, so Alex could have been this, like, this is her heel turn or something. You know, this is where she turns and becomes, like, she's starting to get corrupted or something or starting to become bad. Or she's just, yeah, she just, she doesn't want to take, she's tired as hell and she's not going to take <laughs> She's not going to take anymore. Yeah. But because then the G-Man shows up, too, and, like, whisk her away. And I thought that was super interesting because the G-Man doesn't seem like a noble soul either. So there's something sinister going on there. And he looks been... fine to me. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> he looks like a real sweetheart. But you do, it does set it up where you're like, okay, well, what's going to happen with Alex? This could easily have set up, ended the game from Gordon's point of view. And then if they wanted to continue on Alex's story, they could have set that up in a different game or a different series. Sure. Like oh, Walking Dead. Something, <laughs> yeah, <exactly>. something, <laughs> something to mention that we kind of brush past is like in that jumping around time, you know, that the Borealis is doing. Um, one of the reasons Alex wants to blow up the ship is because she thinks that uh, Alex, this is Alex grew convinced we were seeing one of the Combine's central staging areas for invading other worlds such as our own. Right. So the idea is that like the Combine are concerned with hundreds of other planets, not just Earth, you know, and she yeah. basically sees a window to like, if we blow that up, we could we could stop the Combine for good. Let's send the Borealis in there and blow it up, which is a pretty good plan yeah there's one line in here too where he's kind of like battlefield earth that's what they do in battlefield earth if you guys recall oh so it's a (laughs) ripoff that's right they created a time traveling missile and steered it into the heart of the combines command center it's a bunch of cool words that's a back of the box of blurb if i ever saw one. oh yeah that's it yeah so and then and then it's like uh with the g-man sort of shows up as they're about to set off the explosive i think right uh as gordon's like well, I guess he appears twice in the ending, doesn't he? Yeah. Because he takes Alex with him. And that's what the person was asking about, because there is some implied past between them. Yeah, because he, uh, uh, Layla writes that like she had not seen him since she was a child or something like that, right? Right. Yeah, which is crazy. Like, the G-Man is so weird. Like, he's like... He's dealing with the Vance family, and then he's got Gordon hired like freelance or something because he offers you a job at the end of Half Life. Or, mm-hmm. uh, so man, I and I love that there's this other like, and he sort of started this whole thing, and but then he does generally seem to be good because he saves you a couple times. He's so confusing and weird, and I just I love how mysterious he is. And Laidlaw's you know story here does not really open up any new sort of information about him. Like, I still feel like I feel like I know as much about G-Man as I ever have. Yeah, that's the thing is it made me wonder how much exactly the writing team and Mark Laidlaw himself really know about the G-Man or how much is just let's have a cool guy who does cool stuff. Because it's not like I need every mystery to be solved. You know, he's cool as a mysterious character. Yeah. But this doesn't build on the mystery of him very much. Yeah. But at, at some point, do you want any of the mystery to be revealed? I mean, I should maybe yeah. that's the wrong phrase. Like, I I want it, but like, is it helpful to the narrative, and is it helpful to the story? Because once you've revealed like his past, like he's he's not as interesting anymore. Because half of what makes him interesting is because he's mysterious. Sure, yeah. And then also, it's like, can anything they come up with and explain to you live up to what's been built up into your head as this like mysterious creep character and like you find yeah. out his past you're like oh that's it like, that's the exact thing that i'll like logically say you know this makes sense for them to do but in my heart i'm sad if we didn't learn <laughs> what the g-man was all about yeah i am too and that's kind of like the catch-22 of having a character like that yeah, yeah totally. i would i would like to know who he's working for because he seems to imply that there's like another sort of interdimensional thing happening that he's involved with like the f man the f man <laughs> the a through the a through uh h man yeah uh but he um uh you made me lose my train of thought leo those the, the i can keep man. listing <laughs> letter mans <laughs> to buy you time uh, but uh i there's there's sort of a theory that go that's been going around that maybe he is like part of the combine too like that he is just sort of facilitating their invasion i mean he 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 pulled gordon away for years while the while the combine invaded yeah so uh, but, but then yeah. said he would like appreciated his work at yeah. the end of half-life 2 that's that guy's weird 
Yeah, what's up have with we, that guy? Have we really what like hammered weirdo. that down enough that the G-Man is really intriguing and mysterious and weird and scary? Ben Hansen pointed out it stands for good man. Oh, so, that's so. Oh. We can talk about that for a little Wait, bit. Wait, the good bar man? Is that <laughs> this the is? good bar man? I think oh. it's John Goodman. <laughs> John Goodman. Oh, okay. well, just a theory. Speaking of mater- mysterious uh, figures, the Vortigaunts appear at the very end as well. Right. So yeah. right as right as Gordon is about to like ram the ship into the heart of the combine area and blow it up. Uh, there's this cool line where it's like he realizes that this plan is like not really going to do much. He's like, I saw the Borealis, our most powerful weapon, would register as less than a fizzling match head as it blew itself apart. That would have been a combine. cool moment. Which it would have been like kind of fun to like watch this thing like boop. No, nope, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's like somebody on the radar like turns over. It's like, what was that? It was <laughs> just the, the the slugs sort of looking yeah, at each other, like, huh? clicking or whatever. Was that something? I don't know. So a meteor, and then but before he dies, the Vortigaunts appear and like whisk him away. Yeah, and it sort of ends with this, uh, with him sort of like reappearing years later in the future. Uh, presumably Earth, right? And yeah. nobody recognizes him. No, really, nobody even really knows who he is anymore. Yeah, and that's kind of like an interesting parallel to the beginning of two. So it kind of like comes full circle in a sense. Yeah, because you can kind of see that like rhythm, and like that's a that's a cool way to end a series. Yeah, because so the idea is that right before the explosion happens, G Man takes Alex, and the Vortigaunts save Gordon, and then he's so he's still alive, and then the Combine are still around, presumably like injured, but still present. Right, and that's kind of where it's left. Like there could be more to do. You could still find Alex. There could be more Half Life games, but yeah, you know, I don't know. It it could also be it it sort of functions as a satisfying conclusion as well. Pseudo satisfying, I would say. I yeah. think it's better than Episode Two if they were going to end here. Yes, it doesn't sort of resolve. It doesn't defeat the villain fully. Yeah, it doesn't resolve sure. the main conflict that the combine of the combine. Right. It 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 introduces new mysteries with Alex and the G Man. Uh, and which we sort of went over. We don't need all of those resolved, but I think it'd be nice to get a little bit more of a, a resolution. Yeah, it'd be a pretty bleak ending for for the whole series if this was it. Yeah, yeah. And so, some ways, like it doesn't feel totally like satisfying to me, but it it does feel better than two, and at least feels like oh, I could see them using this as a wrap up for the episodes for sure. Yeah, and then it's set up if they want to do something in the future with Alex or or whatever. Yeah. I could see this as the end of Gordon's story in a sense. Like, well, this is just a guy who's sort of like in the right place or in the, the wrong place at the right time and yeah. and saw these things and sort of had these adventures. And But he's just really a cog in a much larger in machine. G-Man's machine. Yeah, maybe. exactly. Yeah. Uh, Gordon man. <laughs> maybe. Hey, oh? I've heard that theory too, that the G-Man is Gordon Freeman. I don't really know how You're that You're first person, so you might just be looking at a mirror every That's time. That's why he never talks. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah, I think we figured it out. <laughs> Uh, any final thoughts here? It was weird. Uh, Mark Laidlaw wrote it as though Gordon Freeman, or what's the name that he came up with? Gertrude, Gertrude Morgan something? Fremont. Fremont or something Gertrude like Fremont, uh, writing a letter to no one in particular. Uh, so it was weird to kind of read this, uh, thinking about it being Gordon's voice because you never heard that before, you know? Yeah. But, but then he like writes a monologue about uh, everything that we didn't get to see in this game that doesn't exist. Yeah. What if this was Gordon Freeman's monologue at the end of Half-Life 2 episode three? He <laughs> oh, finally he just... spoke and it was just four pages <laughs> just describing recaps. everything that happened. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be amazing. Let me tell you what just happened. Uh, I kind of imagine that he sounds like Barry Manilow. Oh, yeah. That my, sense. Can we hear what that would sound like? I hope this letter finds you well. <laughs> It's me, Gordon Freeman. Gordon Freeman. Um, yeah, I I'm I am happy to have uh, a conclusion to Half Life Two, so to speak. Thank you. <laughs> you know? uh, uh, but I'm I'm a little upset. I am not, I guess not upset, but bummed that like this is how I had to experience it. Was just reading a blog uh-huh. on Mark yeah. Laidlaw's website. Um, I was I, I I would have obviously preferred to have played through this story. <laughs> Um, but yeah, even even some accompanying art in like comic book form or something, I don't know, might have been cool. interesting or a novel, like maybe yeah. you could write a novel yeah. about this. Because I, I, I'm on Mark. Me. What are you doing with yeah, your come life? On, get, add some extra words here. What are you doing? <laughs> this is this four pages? This isn't a novel. <laughs> this isn't a game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But uh, how do you guys feel about it? Is this, I mean, is this a satisfying way to maybe not see any more Half-Life story? I never thought we were even going to get this much. So I'm happy. Yeah. Yeah. In a sense, like, it's cool that we got this. I agree. Um, I, you know, we're not the first people to say this, but Valve worked themselves into a corner a little bit. Or I, I understand the pressure that Valve might feel in trying to, like, Oh, deliver more Half Life! Deliver more Half Life! Well, Half Life is this brand that like has, has reached legendary status because yeah. of the first two games like just happened to be so good that they sort of rewrote the world, rules of the industry, right? So like ha- trying to do that again, like that's a lot of pressure. Like, oh, just make another game in this revered series. Like, yeah. even if it's just mediocre, or even if it's just like a good game, like that's it's not going to live up to the hype surrounding it. So I understand. Um, and again, we're not the first people to say that, but like, at least we got this. Like, the story sounds cool, and it could be a really cool game. But yeah. um, we're probably not going to get it. <laughs> uh, but Valve, you know, please feel free to go and make this game. Uh, it sounds like you guys could knock it out pretty quickly. How soon do you think we'll see a fan-made source mod that's this game? Oh man, or at least the announcement. Probably like after the videos. Three down weeks here. or three months, yeah. I think. Honestly. Yeah, three months. Three That's months sounds good. reasonable. And then Valve might even give the thumbs up. I mean, honestly, you know, they've done that before, sort of accepted things into their own canon. If it's good enough. Made by fans, so. Well, but that is like mostly remakes and stuff, right? Well, I think there was a couple Portal things that were sort of expanded universe that they mm. kind of said that they were okay with, so. All right. Make it well, happen. You hear that, fans? It's a challenge to you. Steam was actually a fan-made project that they... <laughs> I heard that. Okay too, yeah. That's right. Gabe Newell, not a real person. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think a yeah. pair of fans came together to create him. The... Hologram. There we go. So that that is that is basically Half-Life 2 Episode 3. Um, so there you go. We did it. <laughs> we did it. Us three. We did it. Good the job, book guys. is closed. The book is closed. We uh, tricked think... everybody into thinking this is a real post from Mark Laidlaw. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching this video. And, uh, you know, go to GameInformer.com and you can find a story that Reiner wrote all about trying to find Half-Life 3 that's very interesting. Yeah. Thanks for watching.